Hello and a warm welcome to the programme. I'm Minister Walker in Lagos. Around 70% of the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, woke up without power this morning as work continued to restore the city's water supply. Russian attacks on energy facilities have caused power cuts across Ukraine. Kyiv's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, said energy firms were trying to restore electricity as soon as possible, but this would depend on the balance in the national grid. Across Ukraine, winter is setting in with snow and sub-zero temperatures. Earlier today, it was described as a thick, wet mist hung over Kyiv. They said that you can make out the shapes of nearby buildings, but barely. The only light seemed to be the headlamps of cars. Many people now see their workplace as a refuge from the cold because at least the heating is always on, unlike at home. That's according to Kiev's mayor. But many in Kiev seem matter-of-fact about the hardships they are facing, finding ways to work around it. More and more people are installing generators as a means of having backup power. And running water is also no longer a guarantee even before yesterday's latest missile attack. Elsewhere, the Deputy Prime Minister of Moldova uh, says Russian missile strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure has caused blackouts across half of the neighboring country. Electricity outages were also reported in the breakaway Russian-backed region of Transdenistria. The local interior ministry said this in a statement. Power was later restored in Tiraspol, the capital of the region. Moldova is one of Europe's poorest countries and has the highest per capita intake of Ukrainian refugees. Both the Moldovan police force, uh, the Premier Energy, a Moldovan company that supplies electricity across the south and center of the country, has asked people to remain calm and take precautionary measures. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says he will rebuild infrastructure damaged in Russian airstrikes. Russia rained down missiles across the country on Wednesday, killing civilians, damaging critical infrastructure as Moscow pursued its campaign to plunge cities into darkness and cold at the start of winter. Explosions could be heard in and on the outskirts of the capital, Kyiv, and three people were killed, including a 17-year-old girl with at least 11 wounded. The power blackout ensued in and around the capital with the first snow of Ukraine's winter falling. Authorities worry about the impact of power cuts affecting millions. Now, since October, Russia has openly acknowledged targeting Ukraine's civil power and heating systems with long-range missiles and drones. Uh, Moscow says the aim is to reduce Kyiv's ability to fight and push it to negotiate. Ukraine says the strikes on infrastructure are a war crime deliberately intended to harm civilians to break the national will. Russia denies that its troops are deliberately attacking civilians or that they have committed the atrocities. She said... The EU Parliament declared Russia a state sponsor of terrorism today. Finally, I am grateful to all the European parliamentarians. Then, Russia proved it's true to the whole world, launching 67 rockets at our infrastructure, at our energy, at regular civilians. The result is tragic. There is a big number of wounded. There are killed ones. Please accept my condolences, all who lost relatives and close ones. Concerning electricity and water supply, everyone is working. Electricians are working. Rescue servicemen are working. Everyone is working. Local authorities, the task is set. We will rebuild everything. We will get through it all because we are unbreakable people. Thank you all. Take care. Glory to Ukraine. Well, we're still the same subject of um, the power in Ukraine, the power cuts and the excessive barrage of missiles from Moscow. Uh, Ukrainian president appealed to the United Nations Security Council to take action to stop Russian airstrikes. Via video link, he said his country uh, in one day received 70 missiles. He called it the Russian formula of terror. 
It was addressing the council chamber in New York while adding that hospitals, schools, transport infrastructure, residential areas had all been hit. The council is unlikely to take any action in response to the appeal since Russia is a member with veto power. Mr. Zelensky called for Russia to be denied a vote on any decision concerning its actions. Members of the council, we... We uh, await in a very firm reaction of the world to today's Russian terror, response of our partners, response of our friends, not just observers, but uh, a reaction from all those who really recognize the UN Charter. We're doing everything possible. Ukraine represented a peace formula. The world heard it, uh, 10 items in, in order to may empower the Charter of UN and uh, violated by Russian guarantee security for Ukraine, Europe, and all the peoples of this planet suffering from the consequences of the Russian aggression. Um, so today is just one day, but we have received 70 missiles. That's the Russian formula of terror. This is all against our energy infrastructure. There is a hit also uh, with the uh, residential house damage. Uh, hospitals, schools, transport, uh, residential districts uh, all suffered. The Russian terror led to a complete blackout, not just in Ukraine, but also in, in neighboring Moldova. So, but we cannot be hostage of one international terrorist. Russia is doing everything to make an en energy generator a more powerful tool than the UN Charter. But we can bring the real sense uh, back to all the things. And first of all, the UN Charter. We need your decisions. He is clearly, clearly weaponizing winter to inflict immense suffering on the Ukrainian people. He has decided that if he can't seize Ukraine by force, he will try to freeze the country into submission. If he gets his way, millions of Ukrainians will be left without power water and heat during these cold winter months. We have stressed more than once that we are not against his participation. However, this participation should be in person. This is required by the rules which have guided the Security Council for 75 years now, especially as Mr. Zelensky isn't even participating in the meeting. What we're hearing from Mr. Zelensky and his supporters is not at all a readiness to achieve peace, but rather the language of reckless threats and ultimatums. The damage to residential housing and victims among the peaceful population is indeed caused by the Ukrainian air defense systems, which are not located at the outskirts of the cities, but in the very center. As a result, debris from missiles, those that hit those places, which Russia never targeted. So, for example, today, Ukrainian users posted photos on the internet of missiles that hit residential homes in Kyiv. Turns out that these missiles were American air defense missiles which were supplied to Kyiv. The spillover effects of the war uh, against Ukraine are felt increasingly in the neighboring countries, including the Republic of Moldova. The Russian aggression against Ukraine has by far deeper implications on the Republic of Moldova's security and stability. The continued attack on Ukraine's energy infrastructure have left Moldova again in the darkness uh, following a similar incident on November 15. More than 50 percent of the country was left without electricity. There have been massive blackouts across the country. Water supply was also affected in the pumps were taken out of the order. Dr. Michael Ogo is a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science and Public Administration, Babcock University. He joins me now. Welcome to the program. I'd like to begin flowing from what we heard at the you. UN Security Council, and, and this is the conflict that now appears to be affecting neighboring countries, Moldova, Poland, be it an uh, airstrike from Ukraine or even Russia. I mean, they didn't think about this in terms of just having an energy crisis that now seems to be a security threat. Mm. 
Yes, thank you very much for having me, Millicent. Um, and um, I, I think it's it's um, it's been a long time coming. Um, these these are these are things that you know one would have expected to already have been happening before now because this war is well in its um, almost in its ninth month, if not tenth month, so thereabout. You know, so so these are these are um, these are challenges that we will continue to see. You know, if the if if the war doesn't um, come to an end as quickly as possible, which of course is not. Um, it's not very feasible. I mean, we are actually not seeing an, an, an end in sight yet. So definitely uh, the, the consequences of the war in Ukraine would spill over to neighbors, uh, to neighboring countries. And we could also see, um, um, we could also see Belarus, you know, um, um, in, in terms of the connection with the military strategy of Russia and all that, you know, some, some weeks back. So these are these are things that are not very surprising. Um, and as as the war continues, as the war lingers, you know there will be more consequences that will be felt. You know, several miles away from Russia, several miles away from Ukraine. You know, in terms of in terms of um, humanitarian issues, in terms of security. You know, whether it's uh, energy security or human security concerns, food security, and all of these things will continue to uh, become more complicated as the war drags on. When we come to what the Ukrainian president has talked about, um, the, the deaths, the blackouts, the uh, Ukraine cities are being pounded by Russian missiles. Um, what's the trend? Is Russia trying to destroy cities, even though Russia has said that it isn't it, um, has rather blamed uh, Ukraine? And then also we heard from uh, the Russia's ambassador to the UN talking about American weaponry uh, to Ukraine that has caused this infrastructure damage. Uh, well, it, it, it is the, it's the blame game, I think, that is going on now. Um, you know, every side is trying to blame one another. And um, there, there are also possibilities because, you know, you, you actually mentioned one of the headlines that Russia is denying um, some of these attacks, you know. Uh, so it is, it is possible, you know, that some terrorist elements uh, have also come in, some criminal elements have, have, um, have seized the opportunity of a conducive conflict environment, you know, to also perpetrate their own um, criminal activities. So all of these are possibilities, all right? Um, but it's important to understand, too, that Russia has not really achieved its objective in going into this invasion in the first place or in going into Ukraine in the first place. And so um, it is going to be doing a lot, you know, to try and, um, and um, get Ukraine to its knees as quickly as possible. And just like the, um, the U.S. I think, I think the U.S. ambassador, you know, uh, the U.S. representative in the Security Council was just mentioning that since Ukraine cannot um, um, win, you know, uh, you, since Ukraine cannot win the war, they will try to freeze. Uh, sorry, since Russia rather cannot cannot win, they will try to freeze Ukraine, you know, to get them to a point of surrender. So I think that is what they are trying to do, you know, um, largely. Uh, all right. So while they are while they are claiming not being responsible for for some attacks, you know, they are definitely, I mean, they are the ones who are the corporate, the major corporates in this in this invasion. And um, they have objectives too that they want to achieve. So I'm sure that, you know, somehow, you know, these are this is all a part of the strategy, I think. So Ukraine's leaders also urged the world body to act um, against Russia over the attacks. Um, but what can the UN Security Council do um, with you know, the veto power, which Russia also has. Uh, some would say this is a case of um, a member of the UNSC being the oppressor here, even though they disagree. Yeah. You know, this, this issue of the UNSC has been um, quite a very, very interesting issue in terms of international relations, international, international political discussions, because um, this, is, this is when the efficiency and... Um, the efficacy of this organization is is put to question, you know, and several several scholars, several researchers have been asking, what exactly, you know, is the responsibility? What exactly, how efficient, you know, is the UN in this um, in this particular conflict, you know? And um, sadly, you know, sadly, as 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 much as we want the UN to do a lot more, um, the UN is not structured in such a way that it can produce um, the desired outcome in this conflict particularly and of course in similar conflicts across the world number one because the it, 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 number one because russia which is a which is a key perpetrator of this conflict is a member of, is a is a principal member of the security council you know a decision-making member a veto member 
And so it is, it, it's just like, it's just like you being a judge in your own case, you know? Uh, so there's, there's very little that the UN Security Council can do because Russia has a bit of power and Russia can always, you know, step down any decision that is made against it and which is not in its favor. You know, so if the UN Security Council and the UN body, you know, in general can, can, can make any meaningful impact in these conflicts and similar conflicts, you know, in the future, um, there needs to be a reform. There needs to be a reform of the Security Council composition, you know, needs to be a reform of other key key structure and, and, and framework of the UN to make it more responsive, you know. But so far, all that the UN can do is provide humanitarian response, you know, uh, is to continue to call for ceasefire, continue to call for negotiation. That's, that's barely all that the UN can do at this point. And it is very sad. It is very sad. On the part of Russia, we keep hearing that they are ready to engage in peace talks without any conditions. But the truth is, are they, is that really true? Well, your your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, Russia Russia is a very Russia is a very slicky uh, slicky state. You know, if, if you ask me, and um, uh, as as much as as much as they want to, you know, maintain a particular international reputation, you know, um, they have they have objectives too, which is why they have lingered this war for this many months. Um, so I'm not sure that at this point. You know, with of course not achieving their objective so far, I'm not sure that they want any kind of negotiation without conditions. You know, and even negotiations with conditions will be very scrutinized. Will be very. I mean, we have had we have had we have had we have had cases of negotiations in the past. You know, where um, there were there were conditions too. You know, and those conditions didn't those conditions didn't favor either of the parties at this conflict. So I'm not I'm not very sure that Russia is sincere about this. Um, uh, this this call for negotiations without condition. I, I don't think um, that is that represents you know the kind of the kind of or portrays the kind of uh, state Russia is. So, Doctor Ogu, would you now support uh, Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky, who says that honest peace can take place only with the complete demolition of Russian aggression, um, and saying that they're not ready that if there is a perhaps temporary ceasefire, it's an opportunity for Russia to regroup, and so they're not going to accept it. Exactly. You know, the issue of peace negotiations, especially when conflicts have lingered this much, yeah, uh, is 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 quite a complex. Um, discussion. There are so many factors to consider. There are so many sides, you know, to it. And so, um, 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 it is. It is quite complicated. You know, it's not. It's not. It's not something that we can. We can just uncover in one discussion. It's a very complex issue. But I think that, you know, there is always a way out for negotiation. I mean, it. It, it all behoves on the parties involved. You know, I'm. I'm a very strong advocate of the possibilities of dialogue the possibilities of negotiation, the possibilities of interaction, you know, and I think that those are very, very strong diplomatic weapons that can be used even in situations like this to bring about peace. You know, all that it takes is for the parties involved, Zelensky and Putin, to decide that they want to do this and they will find a way to get to the table, to get to some kind of compromise that would seize the, the guns, that will silence the guns and that will bring some kind of relief to the sufferings that people are going through at the moment. All right, just before we let you go, um, Hassan marked the third important counteroffensive after Ukraine forces pushed back uh, Russian troops in, in April. Um, Mr. Zelensky has revealed um, that investigators have already documented more than 400 uh, war crimes. They call it Russian war crimes there. And these are alarming allegations again, seeing that they're coming similar to that of Butcher. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was just I was just um, reading. I think yesterday or so, uh, you know, the fact that there have been some sixteen thousand plus casualties, human uh, civilian casualties, and you know, over six thousand um, civilian deaths, particularly uh, since the since the invasion began. And that um, these are these are very alarming. And of course, you know that in these kinds of reports, you know, what the media reports is a lot less than what the actual figures are. So we can, we can actually project that these figures are a lot more than what has been reported in the media. Um, so yes, you know, there have, been, there have been war crimes. There have been war crimes, no doubt. You know, and um, and um, it, is, it is always very important that, you know, uh, the, the responsible organizations, the ICC, you know, and other perhaps humanitarian agencies and NGOs um, are, are keeping a watch on this because 
as the war progresses, you know, the sides to, to, to the conflict will continue to deny any kinds of direct involvement with war crimes and all that. But we know that when the dust is settled, you know, when the dust is settled, we can, we can count the costs. Um, we can see the reports. People can actually uh, present all of these evidences because that is what actually matters at the end of the day. You know, so I think that the relevant institutions and agencies should continue to do the work that they can do you know, to document these, these evidences, to keep these things in record so that when the dust settles, like I said, um, we can actually know who actually, you know, is on, the, is on the guilty side and who needs to answer questions for what has been done and what hasn't been done. Um, so it is important that investigations continue, you know, so that um, those, who are, those, who are, those, who are, those who should be held accountable are held accountable at the end of the day. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Dr. Michael Logo is a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science and Public Administration, Babcock University. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Welcome back. Staying with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Ukrainians today mourned a 26-year-old ballet dancer who signed up to fight Russian invaders and was killed by a sniper on the Eastern Front. Vadi Kulu Pianets from the National Operetta Theatre in Kiev died during a battle near Bakhmut, a strategically important town in the eastern Donetsk region, according to the military. Fellow performers and staff from the theatre carried his coffin into the venue where people lined up to say their goodbyes. As his coffin was carried out at the end of the memorial, they gave him one last round of applause. His commanding officer, Denis Popov, addressed the mourners, telling them the best sons of Ukraine are losing their lives. He says today's tribute is not what it should have been. <laughs> Meanwhile, when Laura Fernandez, fellow dancers at the Stanislavski Theatre in Moscow, began discussing the war in Ukraine, she knew she would have to leave. Swiss born with a Ukrainian mother, Fernandez, 24, was a soloist at the Stanislavski and rising star of the ballet world when Russian President Vladimir Putin sent troops into Ukraine late February. She says it was just very difficult to be in the dressing room because people started to discuss the war. Uh, she also feared for her relatives in her mother's hometown of Mariupol, the southeastern port city devastated during a prolonged siege before it finally fell in May and the impact it was having on her mother's mental health. Honestly, I mean, people often tell me that um, I would be also great in contemporary repertoire, but for me, I just enjoy classical ballet at the moment so much more than modern. I just, you know, like the classical, I really feel inside of me, of course, the modern as well, but on stage, I don't get this kind of um, joy of it as I would in classical ballet, so I'm I consider myself as a classical dancer, yes. What I love about Giselle is that it's like very emotional. It's like, like a roller coaster. Like in first act, you have to be happy, a uh, girl, right? And full of love. And then the second act is like completely different, like the opposite. And yeah, this is always a challenge for me to find myself, like the, also the emotions.